a line of thought this morning contained in the book of 1 Thessalonians on the subject of entire sanctification. Entire sanctification. We use that word entire because we've heard it often in this meeting and other times that regeneration is holiness begun and sanctification is holiness perfected. Entire sanctification is holiness perfected. And I want to read this morning from the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, beginning with verse 14 and reading most of the rest of the chapter here. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. <clears throat> See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Heavenly Father, we look to thee for thy help and thine anointing, thy direction. We ask thee, Lord, that thou will close us in with thyself in this morning's service. As we look into thy word, the word that has lived across the centuries to bless its multiplied millions. And in this area that we're talking this morning, thou hast gathered out a people in every day and every generation to follow the Lord wholly. We thank thee, Lord, for the revelation of thy word. We're glad we don't have to depend upon the opinions and notions of men and the constant revision of their thoughts and ideas and philosophies. But we thank thee for the word of God that never changes. Across the centuries, it's never changed. God's revealed absolutes. We bless thy holy name that thou hast designed a plan and a purpose whereby that the soul's needs may be fully met. There never has to be a change in God's great and marvelous provisions. We ask thee, Lord, this morning that thou will give the help that's needed for this hour. Make it a profitable hour. Make it an hour that shall bear fruit, not only in this service, but in years to come, that we can remember that God has something substantial and something that will really last. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> now to this reading this morning, this text, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the blessed assurance, confirmation on this, faithful is he who calleth you, who also will do it. I think uh, first this morning, I would like to direct your attention to this letter, this short Thessalonian letter, to the fact that these people for whom Paul is praying in this letter were not backslidden people. They were not uh, just cooled off people. They were, uh, they were people with a real, genuine experience of regeneration. Now, there are a lot of people that they don't think you have room. If you really get a real experience of regeneration, there isn't room left to preach another work of grace. said, what would God do for you in that? One fellow said he just had so much he didn't know how he could stand anymore. Well, just the time element took care of that. A little while later on, he found out that he could take a great deal more than he had on hand at that time. And the Lord deals with us according to our need and according to our abilities and our aptitudes to accept the truth. And it's not a matter of God lacking in power and ability to do for us. People ask the question, why does God have to take two works of grace uh, in giving us what we ought to have? Why can't he do it all at once? 
Well, he has to, you have to reckon he has to deal with whom he's working with. He has to take us into consideration. Uh, we just don't have the capacity and the ability uh, to deal with this, to accept this, only on the plan that he's designed. And he's worked this out according to our, according to us and our need and our abilities. Uh, I could go into that more later. But in checking this, there are at least 15 different, very complimentary things said about the character of these Thessalonian brethren. Now, if you could find uh, in any church 15 blessed complimentary things that could be said about your spiritual relationship, I think you would be in a pretty good condition for a holiness meeting to come along uh, if you had the qualifications that he names here. Uh, just checking this rather hurriedly, if you have your Bibles and like to follow, in uh, beginning with chapter 1 and verse 3, he mentions here their work of faith and their labor of love. In chapter 4, he, he mentions their, their brethren and beloved and calls their attention to the election of God. In verse 6, he, he makes a definite statement that they became followers of Paul and his companions and of the Lord. In verse 7, he states that they became examples or examples to all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia. In, uh, in verse 8, uh, he mentions here that they were, not, they were missionary minded because from them sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place their faith was spoken of. In, uh, in verse 9, he mentions the fact that they had turned away from idolatry, from idol worshipers, to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven. In verse 13, uh, he states that uh, when they received the word, uh, uh, received the word of God, that uh, they received it at, at not as the word of men, but as it really was the word of God in truth. And then in verse 14, he mentions the fact that they became followers of the churches of God, which had preceded them. And in verse 10... He mentions uh, his real confidence by saying that they were really his joy and crown. Uh, in uh, verse 11 in chapter 3, he mentions that here that uh, he had sent Timothy when he was still at Athens to comfort their hearts and to establish them. Uh, uh, to comfort their hearts and establish them in the faith. In verse 5, he mentions here uh, that uh, he was greatly, uh, of course, comforted to know that uh, when he was anxious that the tempter may have tempted them and their labor be in vain, uh, to find out that they were standing uh, fast in the Lord. In verse 10 of chapter 3, he states that his great desire was that he might see them, uh, their face, and might establish that which was lacking in their faith. Well, you can't establish people in the faith when they're not in it. And then uh, in uh, verse 7 of chapter 4, he states the fact here that God had not called them unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And in verse 8, uh, he mentions here uh, that uh, he that despiseth not man, uh, not uh, that he that dis, uh, despiseth despiseth not man, but God, who had also given his Holy Spirit. Then in chapter five, he mentions that they're all children of the light and children of the day, and that they were not in darkness. Well, I think that's enough uh, this morning uh, to let us know the type and character of these disciples at Thessalonica. Now, uh, coming down to the very purpose of this letter and the desire of his heart, we get the heart throb of it in the closing verses where he gives, uh, he gives some uh, 
pithy and loaded uh, words of exhortation here that uh, uh, leading up to the experience and he he's saying to them always be in a spirit of rejoicing keep the spirit of praise alive in your heart that's a healthy state and he doesn't mean that a person will be always in a state of ecstasy that he'll always be in a revival where he can just shout the victory and ride the waves. But he does mean that uh, in our moods and attitudes we're to keep a joyous heart. And that gives you kind of a sunshiny attitude. That's the thing that's convincing. I heard Commissioner Bringle say, uh, most people don't sing enough, he said. Well, we're not all of us special singers, but we can't have a song in our hearts. Thank the Lord. And it's a wonderful thing to keep in your heart the spirit of praise and thanksgiving. So he's saying, always be in the spirit of rejoicing, thanking God. You always have something to be thankful for. Always something to be thankful for. And it's not only a wonderful thing for you, it's a healthy influence toward outsiders. The world is sad. And the world is melancholy. But Christians have an inward secret hidden life and joy. When it's manifested in our lives through a joyous spirit, it makes it attractive uh, to the world outside. And they want to ask the question, what makes that individual so satisfied? How come that you, in the midst of these kind of circumstances, keep such a, such a joyous spirit and an and attitude? Well, this is, if, this is effective uh, to people who are on the outside. And then he's saying here, pray without ceasing. We say, how in the world could I pray all the time when I'm asleep? And, uh, and uh, when I'm so busy, I don't have time to, uh, to do anything else but think and concentrate on what I'm doing. Well, the heart can have a disposition for prayer and all prayer. And simply what he's saying here, just don't quit the practice of prayer. Uh, pray without ceasing. Uh, pray when you feel like it and pray when you don't feel like it. Keep up the practice of prayer. Someone has said to practice the presence of God. Well, sure, he's not saying here that in my sleep when I'm in a state of unconsciousness uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'm engaged in active uh, prayer uh, with expressing it with my lips. But there can certainly be that disposition of prayer that in the closing our eyes at night, the last conscious thing we can think of that we're doing is praying and on the waking of the morning uh, to think the first thought could be on God and the things of God and, a, and breathing a prayer in our hearts so we can take up where we left off when we closed our eyes in slumber at night. I know, I know uh, that this is true and I know that uh, our saints that have practiced the presence of God so continually that you could just about stir a shout up in them most any time, day or night. Someone has said it may not always be a blaze, but it's a smoldering fire. Thank God in our hearts that can soon be enkindled into a flame. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe that. This indwelling uh, fire that's in the heart. Then he goes on to say here uh, that in everything we're to give thanks, that goes along with it. And uh, quench not the spirit and to throw water on the flame. Uh, and a lot of ways the spirit can be quenched. It can be quenched by failing to give vent uh, to our feelings at the right time and the proper time. It can be quenched by looking at things that certainly that are forbidden to look at. That's closer related to this next one. It can be quenched by... Uh, by uttering words that are unbecoming to a Christian, there are many ways the Spirit's flame can be quenched. Yes. Then he, uh, he goes on to say here, uh, despise not prophesyings, that is, uh, don't allow yourself to get in a bad mood because of the preaching, because you have a safeguard here, you don't have to accept everything like a gullible bird in a nest, uh, when he hears a flutter or a noise somewhere, just open his mouth and swallow whatever it's put into it. But we have a, we have a, a prerogative as saints 
of actually testing the preacher. All of them. I wouldn't want you. Somebody said, I know he has light because I gave it to him. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I'm just not so sure about that. In all due respect to all of us, we still are individuals, you know, and uh, we do disagree sometimes uh, on uh, things that the Bible may be silent on and some things that some scriptures that, uh, that uh, even great divines uh, don't all agree on, but we can agree agreeably, or disagree, I mean agreeably, we can still be individuals. Now, I've never taken much stock in a man's attitude when he takes a position, well, I know the whole business now, and I, I just, uh, if you don't come around to my way of thinking, I just can't accept you. Well, he's going to have to be the one that does that. I didn't do it. If a man wants to cut me off of his fellowship because I don't come around to his way of thinking and brand me as a heretic, well, that's his business. I just don't propose to allow myself to get in that frame of mind. We had an old fellow on our campus one time, and uh, it circulates around over in the western part of the country that's a kind of a heretic hunter, Brother uh, French. <clears throat> and uh, every fellow that didn't come up to every par and uh, every, uh, to cross every T and dot every I that he thought they ought to, he brand him as a heretic. Well, got our young preachers to accusing each other of being heretics on the campus there. Uh, they just said heretics all over the place. Of course, it was all in fun, but they, they just became a kind of a, uh, a kind of a uh, saying on the campus, heresy, heresy, heresy. Well, anything is heresy for some folks if you don't, uh, if you don't come around to their way of thinking on everything. Well, uh, you know, the marvelous thing is that a unity that exists in the midst of disagreements is a stronger unity that exists in the midst of agreements. Amen. Are you talking about essentials? No, I'm not talking about essentials. I'm talking about there's a vast area in human relationships, ways of doing things and policies and methods and uh, personal convictions that there has to be a great deal of charity exercised or fellowship would break down completely and instead of being a a blessed people where the Holy Ghost could honor, we've become a suspicious outfit that we couldn't have confidence in anything or anybody. Now we can have fellowship, praise the Lord, and not see eye to eye on everything. Like the old man that said he and his wife had been married for 50 years and never seen anything different yet. And some fellow spoke up inadvertently and said nobody but two idiots could do that. Uh, it isn't the most complimentary thing in the world for a person to say, well, I just, uh, uh, I just see eye to eye on this. Well, we just don't have to see eye to eye on everything. For the, this very next statement says to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Pretty good thing to have a filter along with your basket, or your mixer when you go to church sometimes, to reserve the right to, to do your own thinking. And uh, I'm suspicious of any, any preacher or teacher or person, whoever he might be, that is so far gone on himself that he just couldn't be wrong. He just couldn't be wrong. And if you don't accept him, why, if you don't accept it, why, you're mud. And you wouldn't dare to breathe out loud in some people's, uh, uh, their, their presence because they'd have you branded. If you even kept still when they talked, why, well, they've got you already located, they say. Well, <clears throat> there are two scriptures right together in the book of Proverbs. and says, uh, one of them says, answer a fool according to his folly. And the other one says, answer not a fool according to his folly. I suppose it would be, you'd be the judge in what case, what you should do. Whether you should speak or not speak in a case like that. Well... In this last one here, he mentions abstain from all appearance of evil. All appearance of evil. Not just abstain from evil, but all appearance of evil. That's the reason that a lot of things that we may be misunderstood on and people say, oh, I can't see what, what harm you see in this. Well, there's a connotation there or a tendency that would have the appearance of evil that gives uh, people occasion to think wrong of us when you can, uh, for the sake of your influence, can 
uh, can graciously abstain uh, uh, without losing anything and certainly with great gain to yourself. I've never felt like, as far as I'm personally concerned, uh, like getting on the borderline to see how much I can, just how much I can take. For I feel that, that when I expose myself, by an act of my own will, I'm, ready, I'm already getting on the ground, dangerous ground, where I can't have confidence to trust God to keep me when I am actually violating this precept here of abstaining from all appearance of evil. I feel, I feel I can trust God in any situation if I fall into temptation. But if I walk into it, I'm already weakened and I can't in a situation like that feel that I have any ground to trust God when I'm already leaning in that direction. Well, these are injunctions leading up to this blessed experience that we're talking about of entire sanctification. And people in, in this disposition of heart and soul that he's talking about here are getting on grounds where they are real candidates for the experience of entire sanctification. By the way, I might stop here long enough to just inject this. Uh, my feeling is that every church ought to have, besides their stated revivals, they ought to have a distinctive holiness revival every year at least. Where they emphasize, they place special emphasis all the way through on the doctrine and experience of holiness. I'm convinced that every pastor ought to constantly urge and preach on the doctrine and experience of entire sanctification. The reason I say that, the Word of God stimulates. The Word of God enlightens. The Word of God prods. The Word of God searches. And if, if there's silence in the pulpit on this subject, it can become a lost truth through disuse from the pulpit because we generalize and say, well, we, we've heard it all our lives. We've heard wholeness. It's raised up in it. But I want to tell you this morning that we have a vast number of young people come to our college that don't understand sanctification. That's their main problem. They don't understand. What is sanctification? They've come from holiness churches for the most part. I, I, I would say here that there's a failure somewhere along the line of pressing the issue uh, and the truth so that young people could understand not only the doctrine of holiness. That is, what, it, what is it? What does it do for us? What is it it doesn't do for us? What are the criteria by which I can, can be assured that I have it or don't have it? That's a sad commentary on somebody's ministry somewhere. And I do feel that there is a sad dearth on the preaching of holiness as an experience and as a doctrine to have our people as well indoctrinated in this as the Catholics and the Lutherans and all have their people catechized in their particular oper ecclesiastical operations. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. Now here you have not only a prayer for entire sanctification, uh, which uh, is a statement in this direction, but includes it is entire, uh, in that it does a thorough cleansing, a complete cleansing of the heart. It is entire in that it, it uh, operates on our total being uh, of our trichotomy nature. Now, theologians debate as to whether they're dichotomous or trichotomous. But let me, let me say it this way this morning. And I borrow this from Dr. Muncie, uh, one of the greatest preachers in Southern Methodism in an earlier day, when he said this, As to personality, we're one. As to substance, we're two. Material and immaterial. As to nature, we're three. Spirit, soul, and body. If we could not come to a 
a satisfactory definition in word terms, let me state specifically here this morning that we, all of us, can understand this. We have a definite consciousness of this fact, that we are free in that there is a physical side of us, there is a, a mental side of us, and there is a spiritual side of us. And each of these three areas of our lives have to be satisfied by something different. Our physical being has to be satisfied with physical sustenance. You just can't pray with a man uh, with a hungry stomach if you'd pray a hundred days and satisfy his physical needs. There are laws by which he, his life, physical life, is sustained. And let him do without that sustenance, his body will perish. A man's mind and spirit, that highest nature in us, has to be satisfied. It has to be satisfied with knowledge. Let an individual uh, allow him, if you please, to be deprived of any social contacts whatsoever. He can never even develop a personality. Never. God not only created man as a, as a being with potential, but he also made an environment into which he comes. And there can be no such thing as development of the mind without the mind being fed information. From the time we come into an environment, we begin to acquire and the mind begins to develop. And I would say if we were as curious all our lives as we are the first two or three years of our lives in those first years, we'd be all of us Aristotle's and Socrates by the time we were 21. But we get lazy after we pass some, some of those curious stages, question asking, and we, we just kind of uh, lag. One man said a little boy asked him seven questions before he could get off his horse. Well, why, 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 where, how? These are things that are uppermost in the minds of a curious child. And I say that there, there must be that mental development, but there cannot be any mental development without feeding information to that mind. The intelligent innate ability is there but it has to have the environment and it has to have that food that feeds the mind. But an individual could be perfect in his, uh, his physical anatomy and every organ perfectly sound. But he could be a moron in this area. Or he could be perfectly physically sound. He could be a marvelous uh, intellect. Uh, have a marvelous intellect and he could have a knowledge of world affairs and in many areas in the field of science and philosophy and history than all the great areas of learning. But there's another part of him. And that's the sad thing in modern education. Way back in Muncie's day, in analyzing the total threefold being of men, he said the sad thing that was in the 60s of the last century when he made this statement. The sad thing, he said, is that modern education is failing to take under consideration the total nature and being of man and makes him a lopsided type of an individual when he cuts him off from God and his education in this field. Yes. And all of our modern education, almost all of it is godless and leaves out and rules out this most essential part of, of, a, of our being, of our being, the soul. That part of us, which is the seat of affections, of hate and desire. And that part that Jesus speaks about, it would be better, uh, uh, it would be unprofitable if we gained the whole world and lost that. That part of us that reaches out after God and that part of us that can never be happy apart from fellowship with God, and you can't feed the soul just on mere intellectualism, nor can you feed it upon materialism. It's something that cries out for an affinity with God, to love God, and to, and to adore God, and to, 
and to worship God, that part of our nature. I can't take time to go in all this field and argue this question further. It's enough for us to know here that Paul prays for these three areas of our lives, a total, a total sanctification of our total moral and spiritual and physical being. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, in the fifth chapter of Galatians, uh, verses 19 through 21, Paul lists the works of the flesh. He doesn't list all of them because he winds up by saying, and such like. So he could have added to the list. But he names, I believe, 17 of the works of the flesh. Let me say to you this morning that the word flesh uh, is not synonymous with the body. The word soma is the word translated body which has, re has reference to uh, this physical being of ours. But the word here is not soma, but the word is sarx. It is the same word that Paul uses in the 8th chapter of Romans when he said, So then they that are in the flesh, sarx, cannot please God. And somebody said, Yes, I, I, I knew the Bible said as long as we was in this old body we couldn't really please God. But he doesn't use soma, he uses sarx. And people quit reading too uh, too quick right here at this point for he follows up and says but ye are not in the flesh well you know that they were in the body he wasn't writing to folks in heaven he was writing to folks on earth they were in the body so then you're not in the flesh you're not in socks but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you or indwells you Praise the Lord. So that there are sins named in this list category here of the works of the flesh that hits all three categories of our total being. I want us to look at them hurriedly this morning. And I realize that a study of this kind uh, takes some time, but I'd like for you to look at it as you listen. Now you can read it in your Bible and pick them out, but I have listed them here under spirit and, and mind connected. The sins of the Spirit out of this category would consist of idolatry, witchcraft, and hatred. Here are where people are thrown off the track. Here's where they're led astray from the field in their mind. Dr. Clark in his comment on Job chapter 3 at the close says that the devil always has access to the mind. This enemy always have, has access to the mind. And he can inject into the mind most anything that he wants to. What you do with it after he's injected that depends upon your will and your resistance toward whatever subjects or suggestions the enemy may make to your mind. But here's where a lot of people get in trouble. People ask the question, well, why is it if you holiness folks are right, why is it that so many brilliant people Highly educated people, highly intellectual people that have done, uh, have made such a mark in the world. How is it that they don't see this? Well, the reason they don't is that they didn't want to, Paul said. Paul said they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't make a place in that powerful intellect for God. That's the reason that they're where they are. They got tripped up on this point. And this, I call your attention to the fact, is not a matter of intellect. It's a matter of morality here. For they have made a moral decision on this, and they have said we don't want to retain God in our knowledge. You can read the outcome of what happens to this as it goes uh, retrogressively down the ladder until they get beyond, uh, they get beyond help from God and become entire uh, reprobates where they cross the dead line and are nothing but subjects to be damned and lost forever and it starts right in this area here where they don't like to retain God in their knowledge well idolatry you say well uh, my my here we are in Christian America that's for India uh, that's for Africa that's for uh, for the 
lands across the seas. Now, I called your attention this morning that you don't have to uh, hew a god out of a piece of wood or, or chip one out of a piece of stone or to make it out of anything else. For the Bible tells us that covetousness is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. And covetousness is an inordinate desire. It's an inordinate desire uh, where it puts things above God and above good sense and above that which is best for you. It's an imbalance of a normal desire when it becomes covetous. So the reason he says that covetousness is idolatry is that people can make material things idols. They can make children idols. They can make a lot of legitimate things idols. For they set their minds on them and put them before God in their thinking. I've heard people say, well, my God doesn't condemn me. Well, I don't think he does. Because I think when you created him, you gave him the qualities so he wouldn't condemn you. So your God becomes your concept of him, and that becomes your idol. And you bow before that, the shrine of that God whom you have created, and you like him because he likes you. And he lets you do whatever you want to because his qualities are what you put in him. You say, is that scripture? Yes, the Bible says that they that make gods are like unto them. That's right. Uh, they, uh, that's the nature of idolatry anyhow, is that they, they put into them their human concepts of what they think about God as perverted as they are. So this little God that you created said, well, I know I'm divorced and I like to get married again and... I know what the Bible says, but uh, let's see if I can find something in there to justify. Well, when you take texts out of their context, somebody said they become pretext, and you can prove most anything by the Bible when you pervert it. It doesn't take much to pervert it. You might be like the old colored fellow said, uh, that the Bible said, uh, said, uh, uh, what is it, uh, let every man uh, work. Let him the steal. Let him the stole, rather. Let him the stole steal. No more working with his hands. <laughs> you know. But Robinson, you know, sent an article into the paper one time. Uh, and, and he put a whole bunch of commas and periods and semicolons and colons down at the bottom and said, now you'll know where to put these. <laughs> well, I suppose the old colored fellow thought that, that, that it hadn't, uh, the colons and semicolons weren't where they should be, so he put them where he wanted them. Amazing thing where you can change the meaning of something by just halting at the right time in a sentence. Well, idolatry and witchcraft and heresies. This is in the area of the spirit and the intellect. Here is in the area of the soul, and I list these. Hatred, the seat of affections now, of love and hate and so on. Hatred, variance. All of us know what hatred is, variance. You know what variance, you know what it is to vary, don't you? Variance. Some folks are just born in this case here. I kind of call it the objective case. They're kind of like a business meeting I heard one time where they were meeting, the church was meeting to decide whether or not they'd buy a, buy a chandelier. And the uh, old fellow got up and he said, I object to it for three reasons. First, he said, I don't think we've got anybody in the church that can spell it. Second reason, he said, I don't think we've got anybody in the church that can play it. He said, the third reason is, he said, we need some light fixtures. <laughs> Have you ever seen people like that? They object to it. They're born in the objective case. What? I'm against it. What is it? They're at the strike. They, they go ready, all set to oppose. 
Some people are actually to the contrary. They make me think of the old fellow I read about or heard about out in the garden hoeing. And he got aggravated and he shot and took a whack at it and cut a tomato vine off. <laughs> Variance. Variance. Emulations. Emulations. And they say, what are emulations? One definition is it has, it's ambition to excel. You know, there's some people that they, they want to excel so bad that they, they never can be a good loser. They can never be a, they can never lose gracefully. Now, I've seen that carry over in areas that actually have grieved me at heart. I've seen some folks that couldn't, they couldn't even play a nice little innocent game of croquet or anything and, and lose gracefully. Just have to win. Well, I've played some little innocent games and do yet sometimes for deviation. I've got a mother-in-law that never got past the eighth grade and I have a PhD and she beats me most of the time. <laughs> there are areas where people can excel you no matter what you think you have. <laughs> Wrath. Wrath. Somebody said that uh, anger is a smoldering volcano. Wrath is the eruption of it. And malice is the settlings. It settles down into an old grudge. And you know there's more of those of them in the country than you ever had any idea of? Oh, I forgive them, but I just can't forget it. I, I tell you, it hurts me every time I think of it. Well, thank God there's a cure for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's a cure for that. There's an experience, thank God, that can take that old explosive nature out and it can cure every old grudge until you just don't have any, anything in there that has enmity toward anybody. It's a glorious good feeling to be able to stand on your two feet and look the world in the face and eternity in the face and say, thank God there is no ill will in my heart toward a living soul. Well, that's, that's not only good soul health, that's good physical health. But you can't hold envy and you can't hold, you can't, you can't have these aggravating works of the flesh and let them uh, have dominion over the soul without it destroying you in your physical. It gives you indigestion and a lot of the ill health that there is in this country right now comes, comes about just because folks are holding, harboring old grudges and, and they're little in their heart and touchy in their spirit. Brother, I tell you, I insist that wholeness is, is, is mental and physical therapy. Praise the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to have in self-defense. Strife, seditions, envies, murders, all of these come in the area here. But there are the sins of the flesh or the sins of the body and belong to the body. Named right in this sarks and the total here. Of adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, drunkenness, and reveling that come in these three categories and these are, are clearly defined here to let us know that these are perversions. What is a vice? It's a perverted virtue. It's twisted and, and, and besmirched by sin and the devil and corrupted from its natural use. These works of the flesh here are listed and here they are. There isn't anything more wonderful in all the world than a beautiful marriage and the chastity of both bride and bridegroom. But when, uh, when uh, uh, life outside of this area of holy matrimony, it becomes perverted and becomes the most horrible thing in the world. The world is full of it. Thank God for an experience that the Bible teaches here that can affect a cure in every area of our lives. Thank God, the reason I like to preach holiness, the reason I like to preach what I want to preach is because I can preach something that does something for people. Amen. Never has been any greater satisfaction in my ministry than to see the conversion 
that has taken place in some of the most unlikely people that I could name this morning who have been so totally transformed by the grace of God and so thoroughly sanctified that you can't even imagine they were ever out in such a life as that. Well, there's a vast difference. There's a vast difference. You can say what you want to in, in the line of preaching uh, that uh, people listen to. A little preacher got up one time. He's subscribing to the doctrine of a sinning religion and that you sin with the body and all that. He got up and he was furious uh, in opposition to wholeness and fighting wholeness. And he said, he said, there's nobody that lives without sin. He said, I've broken every commandment in the Bible since I got in the pulpit tonight. Old sinner man jumped up and he said, I dispute that. He said, how in the world could a man break the Sabbath on Tuesday? <laughs> God help us. Oh, fellow subscribing to this doctrine, just the old body that sins. It's the old body that sins. The spirit, the soul is like a jewel in a dunghill. It's never polluted, never affected by the flesh. Stays as pure as pure can be, but the old body's corrupt and rotten. And the whole thing, and some of these days we'll get out of it and it'll go back and it'll go through a process of purification in the ground and then God will raise it up and purify it and then they'll get together in heaven. Well, I'll tell you, they better get together here first. There'll have to be a harmonizing here in this world right here below. The little fellow said one time, subscribe to this doctrine, he'd stolen a horse and the sheriff went out to arrest him. And he pulled his doctrine on that sheriff. He said, Sheriff, I didn't do this. I didn't steal this horse. And my old body stole it. Well, the sheriff said, that's what we came after. <laughs> he said, if your spirit and soul want to go along, it's quite all right. But we came after your body. <laughs> your body is what we came after. Well, the Bible teaches not only here, that the opposite of that, that our bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost. That the temple of God is holy. That the body can be so sanctified and so purified. Thank God. And the spirit and soul can be so sanctified and purified that this three-story being of ours, of uh, the upstairs and the main floor and, and the basement, can be clean from, from the top uh, to bottom. Praise the Lord. That our spirits, our spirit can have, have dominion and rule over the body and over the soul. Our motives can be pure, thank God. And our desires can be regulated by the blessed Holy Spirit. And though tempted and tested, thank God, with the indwelling Holy Spirit abiding in the total part of our being, thank God, we can live a life of purity and holiness right here in the midst of a world that's foreign to it. Glory to Jesus forever. Jesus prayed this way. He said, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Amen. You don't have to move out of the city or anywhere else if you have enough of, of the power and the holiness of God in your own heart. You can live anywhere God wants you to live and be as free from the contaminations of the world as though you didn't live in it. Praise the Lord. I insist, as Brother French has indicated in his messages, thank God the Holy Ghost can preserve us and keep us right here in this present evil world. We can be as dead to things and conditions and people as though we were not in the world. Now right here is an area in closing that I'd like to, I'd like to say. I believe, since this is true, I believe it's vitally important that we have the proper training. And here's where Christian education comes in, a Christ-centered education. You can say, well, my mind is so settled and I'm so fixed. 
I can just about read anything I want to read. But I can tell you that I've done a good deal of reading in my, myself, but there's some things I don't read. There are some things I don't propose to contaminate my mind with. There are some things that I just don't propose. I got a hold of a bunch of books of uh, the Rutherford crowd one time, and I decided that I would indoctrinate myself so that I'd know how to preach against it more properly. You know what the experience I had with that? I started reading one book, and I, I felt darkness just settle down over my mind. Well, I already knew in substance what the whole thing taught, that it was a total perversion of scriptures. Why should I encumber my mind with a lot of twisted nonsense that had no real benefit to my soul? Why should I fill my mind with a lot of the thinkings and philosophies, of philosophies godless philosophies of men, so that the buzzards from hell can, can come around with these thoughts and plague my mind? Bless God, I have a better exercise. I'll never get on reading what I like to read during my lifetime. And if I live to be as old as Methuselah, I'd never get through reading all the good things that there are to read. I, I grant you that there is something uh, to be said for a minister or all of us acquainting ourselves with the pitfalls of a lot of false teaching so that we may be, uh, we may be armed against it. But to make it a habit of constantly reading on the negative, added, uh, negative side of this question, I don't think it's helpful at all. The boy that was voted the most ideal student in the college from which I was graduated later went to seminary and became a confirmed modernist. Several of those boys that went out for high degrees from a high-sounding seminary for, for influence's sake and for popularity's sake Thought they got through. Actually thought they got through intact without losing their faith. Only to have the old buzzards camp over them after they got out and finally pecked away until they gave up their faith in fundamentalism and the truth and succumbed to the attack of these old buzzards. Oh, I recommend that the mind has certain laws as well as our body. And I don't have to take poison uh, to test it out. I wouldn't experiment very far in that direction. I'll take the crossbones on the bottle. As far as I'm concerned, I'll take what others have tested and found out to be true. I'll believe that. I don't have to fill my body with a lot of experimental things to say, well, will this harm me or not harm me? There are some things already that I know are harmful to the body by tested scientific experiments. I don't expect to allow myself to do anything that would contaminate my body. Amen. And the same way goes for the mind. Praise the Lord. So in the area of, of the spirit of the mind, I recommend a Christ-centered education. I, recognize, I, I recommend a wholesome, consistent reading of the Word of God. I recommend a wholesome, consistent reading and study of the great holiness classics. I recommend that you feed your mind continually on the wholesome things in literature that God has made it possible for us to have in this day. Talk about the wickedness of the age. There's, some other, there's another side to this. We have the greatest heritage in the field of holiness literature that any age has ever experienced. We have a heritage re reaching back 2,000 years of holy history of Christian, the Christian church and literature connected with it. Feed our minds. And I'm going to give you this for what it's worth. I find by being an inveterate reader of good wholesome books and the Bible and that which is constructive to the building of my mind and the building of my spirit and feeding my soul, I find it, it strengthens me against temptation and saves me from the invasion of a lot of things that otherwise would seek to take me over. 
I believe that a lot of people are unduly exposed to temptation because they have a lazy mind and because they don't pursue positively uh, the feeding of their soul in the practical area of their lives. Somebody said, Brother Count, I liked your message because it was down to earth. Well, that's where we live. I, don't, I think we're spending a lot of money to get to the moon when we haven't learned how to live on earth yet. We may talk a lot about how to get to he uh, I mean, about heaven and how beautiful and how wonderful it is. But I'll tell you, it won't do us any good if we don't make it there. And I think the emphasis, I feel that the emphasis ought to be laid heavily in the area of what it takes to get to heaven. For I'll have all eternity to enjoy it when I get there. But I must know, and you must know, the way that's mapped out that leads there. And I don't want to be misled. I recommend in the area of the soul that you keep yourself free from these totally free, from these senseless, uh, devastating works of the flesh which will destroy you. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, envies, murders, and all of these bitter, uh, ugly traits on the inside that destroy the soul. I recommend that you, that you soul, let the Holy Spirit sanctify your nature in this area to where you rise completely above it and come to a solid rest in God where you can trust your future with Him and, and trust that He shall lead in every way to take care of you. I don't know how I, I, I have such little confidence in Social Security. I, I don't think it's sound. You just asked my opinion. I don't think it's sound. I think inflation, one roll of, of strikes and, and wage raises and so on, will keep the, price, the, the process of spiraling of inflation until it'll be a, a farce and a misnomer to talk about so many dollars. We're already talking. We have a dollar complex and we still think in terms of dollars. They're not dollars at all. I recommend in this area of the physical a self-discipline. Holiness will do a lot for you in this area. It'll purify your motives. It will fill your heart with new desires and aspirations. But holiness will not do for any person something automatically. There will have to be the active participation and cooperation on your part. For in this area, there are two natural appetites. I submit to you this morning that in this area, there needs to be a lot of good, clean teaching on a high level to our young people especially. For a lot of people have been enslaved. They have not understood themselves. They don't know what is what about a lot of things and they need someone that's, whose mind is not in the gutter but whose mind is well trained, whose heart is pure and whose disposition to help is, is supreme in this area to instruct them as to what is what and what they may expect. There are two strong passions that, that uh, are connected with this part of our being, the body. Namely, there is the hunger and uh, thirst urge and the sex urge. These are normal. They are not destroyed by any experience of regeneration or entire sanctification. They are God-given and God-endowed and if, if looked upon by the proper perspective and the right attitudes. They are not dirty. They are not something in the area of filth. They are as clean and as natural as any part of our normal being. I say they are God-given in that one of these initiates life and the other sustains it. In this area, God has made a beautiful relationship in both when they are properly uh, used for the purpose for which they were originated. That's the reason that we preach and we say in the terms of St. Paul, husbands, love your wives 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it by the washing of the water, by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In the realm of God's ordained method, in the, in the monogamy form of marriage, God has ordained one wife, one husband. It's a lifetime proposition. It's to be within the confines of this home, the basic, un, un, the basic unit of society, where life at its best is propagated. The family becomes the, uh, the, the, the home becomes the unit into which children are born and nourished and cherished in the atmosphere of love and devotion and concern for their security. You pollute this area of life, it becomes one of the most heinous things that we're witnessing in our day. Children, orphans, children, the victims of a broken home through divorce and and the saddest situation that develops in a wholesale wave of juvenile delinquency. And the poor little children of our day are so victimized that my heart bleeds for them. Never has there been a generation of children that are such objects of pity as the generation in which we now live. I could pray that God would get us holiness folks out of our shells where we're merely thinking in terms of preserving ourselves and looking about our own little personal selves to get us out there where, where the need really is in evangelism to carry the message to these poor lost people. Well, I want to leave this lesson with you for whatever it's worth. I pray God that we may not only be deeply spiritual, but we can have level heads and cool heads and sensible attitudes and, and put this where the Bible puts it and not allow ourselves to be sidetracked by fanatical ideas that would destroy souls rather than to preserve them. I know in this area that this is not beyond the standard that the Bible teaches that our whole spirit, soul, and body can be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we stand together, please?